before, really excited about this, but I just wanted to pop on here and do uh, one more, uh, just kind of, uh, not disclaimer, but I, I guess it can be a disclaimer. But we had got a, a comment a couple uh, weeks ago from someone on, on the, one of the parts that Brad was teaching, and, and they had a bit, little bit of a complaint that wasn't, and I said to Brad, I said, I mean this politely if you case are watching tonight, but they clearly didn't listen to the video at whole. They grabbed onto a piece, and Brad has done a, a very good job at trying to say, hey, these are some of the different ways this could have been taken, because it's impossible for us to really know exactly to go back into the mind of an ancient Israelite or ancient Jewish person, we can't do that. And there's no one alive from that time that's here today to go there. So you can only kind of speculate some of the ways they could have read it. Okay, so like for example, uh, and, and this has nothing to do, Brad's going to, might touch on this when it comes to the genealogy, but for an example tonight, I have an NASB Hebrew Greek study Bible that you can look up the words and it's all there, it's this huge thing. And in the bottom of it, it has this, in the study part, it has a category about the number 40. And they say language that's very similar to what Brad's been talking about these, these last few weeks, about how the number 40 into the mind of someone in that time period was never used to actually be a hard number 40. Like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, all the way to 40. 40 always represented in writing, and then went through, it was quite fascinating to read. But if you use the number 40, it meant like a time of, completion or a set time that was finished, right? So 40 was used, and back in that time period, numbers were used more for analogies at times, which is something we're not used to, because if I say 40, I was in the, if I was in the desert for 40 days, you're going to take me at my word and say, Jeremy was in the desert for 40 days, as were the mind of an ancient Israelite, according to study that has nothing to do, I mean, Brad didn't look that up, I read it on my own, and it merges perfectly, they knew that 40 represented something, and that something meant a time of completion or a set time that had come around and come and finished, right? So does that mean that, so when it says it rained for 40 days, 40 nights, that, that's how we take it, but then could it mean, is there a possibility that according to ancient, an ancient Israelite mind that could have been it rained for the set time and was completed in that time? It could mean that too. Are we ever going to know that? No. <laughs> does it change the gospel story? No. Does it diminish what Jesus Christ did? No. None of that happens, right? So it's just trying to, and the whole purpose of tonight, which I was, uh, Brad and I were talking about earlier, is, and Brad said it many times, and I know this is stemming off a comment that we had that may have been overkill, but it's worth being said again, is that Brad's not trying, this class is not trying to reinterpret Genesis at all. It's just helping us stretch past our mindset of how we've been told that we have to translate it this way, you know, and just be like, oh, wait a minute, when God began to create the heaven and the earth, as opposed to in the beginning, oh, that's interesting, that's an interesting way to, to, to think about it. It doesn't change our salvation message at all, and it's not to really change anyone's minds, right? That's not the point of tonight. So, he's going to be going over something with the flood, and Brad's going to be talking about it, so I'm not going to let him do it, but there's two popular viewpoints of the flood, he's going to share them both, um, and if anyone's watching on live stream or here, just because he shares both of them, we as a church believe, I personally believe in one of them, which is that it, it, um, it covered the whole earth. But Brad's going to get into that, the flood covered the whole earth. But, and and he'll, he'll do that disclaimer there. But just, just remember, um, just when we're doing that, Brad's, when he's teaching this, it's, you know, no one's there from that time period to come back and be like, hey, you're right or wrong. And so at this point, we're just speculating. So we're trying just to kind of open our minds to how some of these scriptures could be translated and just have some fun going in that, in that pool, right? Does that pretty much cover it? Yeah. So cool. So let's, uh, let's pray over Brad, and we'll get into a big one tonight. It's going to be good, part four, and uh, we'll go from there. So Lord, we just thank you for everything that you've been teaching us. And God, we, we love you, and we just are so thankful and thirsty and hungry for your knowledge, for your revelation that you continue to pour out on us in so many different levels, in so many different ways. And God, we're just hungry for your word. And God, tonight we are just excited to have different layers of the onion pulled back so we can see and, and just be in, mo in more awe, increase awe of how awesome and how wonderful you are and how things were made and created, your plan and intent. God, we're just so excited to learn more and we're just thankful for it. So Lord, I ask you bless Brad. God, I pray just for a favor over his words and grace over every word that comes out of his mouth. And we just bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jeremy. 
And uh, thank you, Pastor Todd. Um, see you up there for worship tonight. It's always good to start out with worship. So I, I love it. I was talking to a buddy recently, and he said, you know, the whole church experience should really be, it's just transitional worship. And so I thought that was a really interesting way to put it all the way from the music to the message. So again, prayers tonight has been that the Lord would just use me as a vessel so that we can boast in his kingdom. And also thank you to all of you who came tonight. Thank you for everyone that is watching online right now and in the future. Um, before I get into the, to tonight, and it's, it's almost like Jeremy read my slide three disclaim, disclaimer that's coming up, but I wanted to give a special thanks to Cody, who has worked so hard the past four weeks and has dealt with my computer issues for three weeks in a row. So Cody, this is my thanks to you. Cody will be starring in the play Oklahoma this September, so plenty of time to get your tickets. He's going to be doing the play with um, Todd and Crystal both. So Cody, this is free advertisement for you. Very excited for you. So mark your calendars now, September 22nd through October 1st, so you can come out and see the Peak family in the play. Um, and then to get into tonight, um, here are the disclaimers that, um, again, I feel like Jeremy cheated and looked ahead at these slides, but I'm going to give them again. Um, and Jeremy, I do appreciate you um, kind of just, you know, laying all that out on the table um, for us before we started tonight. But just disclaimer, and this is from week one when I gave this, I believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. And that, again, to rehash what you just said, this is not a reinterpretation seminar, anything like that. This is, this is not me coming in here and saying, hey, guess what, I have all the answers, or, you know, you've believed this your whole life and you're wrong, now come over to the good side. It's nothing to do with that. It's simply to present, you know, various ideas and, and trains of thought that are out there in regards of how the text can be interpreted. And then ultimately, the whole goal of this is really just to build the hope that is, or a, build within us a defense for the hope that is within us. And then thirdly, just, you know, this was the third disclaimer at week one. The information here um, is challenging. It can, to use the Jeremy word, it, it can stretch us. And, this, and that's a good thing. That's how we grow. That's how we learn. So I did make this one that the information covered throughout the six weeks will challenge every theological belief system. And I am not excluding myself from that either. So again, I am on this journey with you all. This is not something I have not figured this out. So this is just me sharing in the journey and inviting you know, you along uh, with me, and we're all walking together in this. So that's, that's, those are worth saying again tonight. Yeah, hey, that word's coming, by the way. Did I say that? Did I say it? I probably did. It's, that word is coming tonight. But this is the important, we've kind of done two thesis statements throughout the series. This is the one that's going to be very important tonight that we've covered in every week, but especially when we get into the flood narrative of Genesis 6 through chapters 8. And that is how the biblical authors organize what they are saying or what they were saying is just as important as what they are saying. So the organization of a biblical book goes hand in hand with the meaning and the message that the biblical authors want to get across. This is not unique just to Genesis or the first 11 chapters of Genesis. This is really unique to the entire Bible, both Old and New Testament. So how it is structured, how it is put together goes hand in hand with the meaning. And then also, just to rehash a little bit, last week, this is, this is one of the slides we went over. We talked last week about um, the serpent and the woman and the man, you know, the serpent, Adam and Eve, how there would be enmity between the two seeds. So again, just this is Genesis 3.15. It says, that, and this is God's judgment because of the deception of the snake. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And that this is really, this is where we get in the story of Genesis and in the Bible. This is where we are being made known that it's going to be important to pay attention to genealogical lists that you see coming up. And within the first 11 chapters, there are two genealogical lists, two chapters dedicated to it entirely. We're going to cover one of those tonight, but I wanted to rehash this because these, gene these chapters of genealogy can often be just brushed over because it's just a huge list of names, but they're of great importance and they do point to something. And I think it's either first or second Chronicles. The first eight chapters start out as just one big genealogy. So if you really want to read about genealogies, go to Chronicles. You can, you can read about them for eight chapters. Um, the other thing that we covered last week was garden imagery and what, and what garden imagery was in the time that the Bible was written to all cultures and, and obviously the biblical culture as well. And that was the idea that garden imagery was the language of heaven and earth in the time of the biblical authors. So God planting his garden, that, you know, the garden that is within Eden, that is where heaven meets earth. And God assigned Adam and Eve as the royal priest in that garden. 
and ultimately we got a perfect high priest that came. Eventually, after, after much um, error on, on human, on the side of humans, we got Jesus who came and fulfilled that role of the perfect high priest. Now, one thing I left out this week, or last week, and I couldn't believe it once I was going back over the material, um, just, this is just amazing. It, it involves the story of Jesus, and it involves the story of Jesus on the cross. So, um, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, the scene is, is familiar. It's when the criminals are on the cross with Jesus, and one looks over um, Adam, and he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responds by saying this. He said, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And that Greek word paradise is the word paradisio, and when it is translated, it is actually the word for garden in many instances. And within the Greek Old Testament, so the Old Testament written in Hebrew, but by the time that, you know, right before the time of the New Testament was written, they essentially made a Greek copy of the Old Testament known as the Septuagint. When the translators, who were all Jewish scribes, translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, they used this word paradisio to describe the Garden of Eden. Fifteen of the 28 occurrences of this word occur in Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3. And I know this slide is hard to see, but basically everything that you see in yellow right there is that word paradisio, and this represents chapter, Genesis chapters 2 and chapter 3. So when Jesus says, you will be with me today in paradise, it's hey, you will be with me in the garden, you will be with me in Eden, you will be with me where heaven meets earth. So I think that's just, that's just amazing, and it's one of the ways that we can really... Uh, I, dive into the mind of someone within that time period as well. That it just, it, to me at least, it amplifies the meaning of it. You know, paradise is not just some far-fetched idea. It's, it's this Eden imagery at play in the life of Jesus. And then we ended last week by asking this very lengthy question, but it was, um, are we allowing the Bible to be what, is it, what it is intended to be, or are we imposing our, our uh, current worldview on the Bible in an attempt to answer uh, the questions that we as modern 21st century humans ask. And so again, this picture, it has shown up every week, it will likely show up again, but just this idea that, you know, we have ancient thought right here, modern thought right here, and when we merge the two together, it makes a pretty picture. In the, in the, in the case of Starry Night and the ultra deep field view right here, it makes a very pretty picture when we combine them, but what you will notice in this picture where they're combined is that the pattern and the imagery of this original picture has been somewhat hit, has been hidden in some places and even removed. And so, trying to dive back in, what did this text mean to the original audience when we? Um, and I, listen, I'm just as guilty as the rest. It's not me pointing the finger to anybody. But when we impose that modern worldview back on the text that we're reading, much of the time unintentionally, just because we grow up in the world now, not in the world back then, we look at it through the eyes that we're familiar with, and we can dive back in to the mindset of the ancient, you know, original recipient, we can, you know, we can see the patterns, and that's ultimately what we're trying to do and weave through. And that's in incredibly important. Um, I, I, I personally believe it's incredibly important, especially for these first 11 chapters of Genesis, given that the terminology, imagery, and themes end up repeating themselves throughout the Bible and are meant to form a pattern and also kind of a, build a vocabulary of, of, of these images, these terms, these themes that we are supposed to carry on with us throughout the text. And chapter 5 is a great example of this. Again, I mentioned chapter 5 is all genealogy. It, it's literally just an, a list of names. And it can be very easy to brush over because it's, I mean, let's face it, it's, it's boring to just sit there and read, you know, so-and-so fathered so-and-so, who fathered so-and-so, who fathered so-and-so, and hey, here were, the, here were all their ages. It's kind of, what, what do I get out of that? But there, there is great meaning in doing it that we'll cover here tonight. But this does follow, this is the second occurrence of that generations pattern that we see in the book of Genesis. Again, there's, there's 10 instances in the book of Genesis where there is a, where it starts with the phrase, these are the generations of. And this is the second one of them. The first one was back in Genesis 2 verse 4, where we looked at that potentially being a transition between the cosmic creation and then the creation within the Garden of Eden. And we also talked about how Within these 10 times, they're never meant to look back, but always meant to look forward at what is, what is going to come. So in this case, um, we see in Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, this is the book of the generations of Adam. And so that's where we'll pick up, but this, this does um, take us back to Genesis 1, 27, where humans are created in God's image. We went over that, the first poem in the Bible that says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. 
And we talked about in week one how because of, because of the wording of that, of the, or in Hebrew, that word man right there, it's a reference, um, it's likely a reference to humanity. So God created humanity in his own image, and we get that because of the male and female right here. Um, and then, again, the, the him right here is masculine because this word is masculine. You know, humanity is a masculine word, and Hebrew, like every other language, pretty much except English, is a gender or is a language of gender. And so, because this is masculine, that has to be masculine too. So, grammar spiel over. Um, we'll get on to actually the first five verses of Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. And I have what you see highlighted here is every instance of the word Adam. And the reason I have it highlighted here is because there's been much discussion about how the word Adam here should be, um, should be interpreted. And every interpretation is open on the table. It, the green, it's set in stone. That is actually Adam as in the, the person Adam. You know, this is the book of the generations of Adam, the man Adam. What you see in blue here is where, every, uh, is where people have questioned, and you'll see every translation um, possibility. So when God created Adam, he made him in the likeness of, of God, and so when I say Adam there, I mean Adam is in the Hebrew word, so you'll see tr some translations will say when God created human or humanity, some will say when God created Adam. All I'm getting at here is that these two instances in blue, there's much discussion around them, and it really has to do kind of what we talked about last week of when, you know, God creating humanity, where Adam and Eve, the first people, all of those views come into play right here. There's really no question once you get down here, because it starts giving the age of Adam, the days of Adam, and thus all the days that Adam had lived. You know, you can't, if that's all humanity right there, then what, how do you explain all of us here today? So it's a reference to a specific person. But there is much discussion around that. Again, you'll find Bibles with, with every kind of translation, every possibility is on the table, so it's, it's one of those that's very much open for discussion. It's, it's an interesting issue to look into, again, just making it known to you here tonight. Interesting to dig into. But when, when we look at Genesis chapter 5 as a whole, we do see a design pattern emerge. And that design pattern, we talked about how it's just naming off a bunch of people. It's, it's very much kind of the, the old or ancient way of doing the edit, copy, edit, paste trick. And then just, you know, if you're sending an email template to a bunch of people, you just delete one person's name and, and insert it throughout the email list. But how, how it occurs is it will say, A lived X years and then fathered B. A lived Y years after he had fathered B. A's whole life lasted X plus Y years. And so X would be the patriarch's age when the first child was born. Y would be the number of years from the birth of the first child to the patriarch's death. And then again, that X plus Y, it's the total combined age. So it does follow this pattern, and it follows it very strategically. Throughout the whole text, there's 10 people listed. Here's a list of 10 of them. And you'll see in blue here, there's narrative inserts at certain points for specific reasons. We're not going to cover every single name on here, by the way. We're just going to highlight some of some of the important ones. This, this list has given much discussion, or there's much discussion around this list, and there's some really just fascinating details that, em that emerge in this list as well. But, and, and we'll again, we'll cover a couple of these people. But you can see here, I got the old guy's rule right there, because the, the ages out here are, are astronomically high in terms of how we understand ages. I mean, you've got the lowest age on there is 365 years, and the highest age on there is 962 years. And so again, these, um, there's connection actually to, um, to several, um, play, well, to one place in the Bible, but then also to a text outside of the Bible from that time period, and we'll actually look to cover them both. I'll start out with kind of the comparison between Cain's line and between Seth's line. So if you remember, Cain was the brother um, who killed Abel, Adam and Eve's first son, Cain, and then Seth was the replacement for Abel that we looked at last week. And so what's building here is this is Cain's line from Genesis chapter 4 right here. And in Genesis chapter 5, we get um, Adam's line through Seth. I'm sorry, I said Abel and I meant Seth. Um, Seth was the replacement for Abel. But so, in the, and it's showing us that Cain's line is kind of that line of sin. And once we get to Genesis chapter 5, we see a righteous line coming forward that ultimately ends in who else? Noah, who is the main character of the flood story. So there's this buildup in genealogy. The genealogy list is a buildup of individuals to show God 
walking with righteous people and building that line through a righteous son, Seth, rather than through Cain. And it really goes back to that verse we looked at from Genesis chapter 3, where the seed of the woman will be against the seed of the serpent. And so you've got kind of, if you want to think of Cain's line as the, you know, the serpent seed line and Seth's line as, that, as the, of, you know, from his mother, from Eve, and how they'll always be at war with one another, you can think of it that way. But I'm, I'm going to hone in on two of these individuals right now. You'll see Lamech we covered last week. He was, you know, from Cain's line. He was the individual that bragged on how, uh, bragged on murdering people and then said, if Cain receives seven times vengeance, I will get 70 times seven. It's interesting here that you have a Lamech in this line too, in Seth's line, and that his total age is, um, go back a slide, 777 years. And so there's an idea that, um, and I, I meant to say this earlier, that there's various interpretations of this. One is that the years are, are to be taken literally as they lived, you know, 930 years, for instance, with Adam. He lived actually 930 years. There's others that would suggest that these years are more just as Jeremy was talking about with 40, that there's actually meaning and kind of, you know, mathematical meaning and kind of, you know, number play going on. And so that 70, 777 could be a play on Lamech in that view. It could also be that the number seven is kind of the number of perfection or a number of completeness. So you get seven, you get seven, seven, seven. So as complete, um, you know, as complete as it can possibly be or in a sense, perfect. And um, yes, and then also, again, you see um, Tubal Cain right here, who's, the, who's from the line, which is a very interesting name. It means produce of Cain, but that'd, that'd be like someone, you know, naming like my great grandson, you know, 10 down the line, like produce of Brad or something. It's just kind of a funny name when you look at it. But, you know, it's, it's three, he has three sons, and then that c contrasts with Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, the other document, this is obviously from the Bible that we're looking at here, so there's, there's a contrast between these two lines here. Again, it goes back to the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. There's also a document from that same time period known as the Sumerian king list, and it is a list of kings you know, that, that descend, and it, there's, there's comparisons that we'll look at between that and Genesis chapter 5, maybe for some polemic literature play going on. Again, polemic is kind of religious polemic in this sense is, you know, kind of an aggressive verbal attack on someone else's beliefs. And in this case, the biblical authors may have been taking shots at other cultures around them saying, hey, it's actually Yahweh who's the one true God. But the Sumerian text is essentially, it's a composition that it was compiled somewhere between um, the second millennium BCE. And it's just essentially a list of kings from that kind of ancient Mesopotamian area. But there's 10 kings from the creation of kingship to the flood. The flood was a, um, that we'll talk about, there was a kind of universal back in that day understanding that a flood had occurred. And so you'll see flood stories from all across the ancient cultures. Talked to Pastor Todd before this, how that can actually be a source of affirming that there was an actual event. If everybody's talking about an event that happened, just gave details a little bit different. Hey, something probably happened. Let's just figure out which one was actually right. Um, we obviously would, would believe that the biblical one is correct uh, for many, many reasons. But um, yes, there are 10 kings from the creation of kingship to the flood. The first king, who I'm not going to try and pronounce his name, is appointed by the oldest gods. And then the final king is chosen to survive the flood. In contrast to this, there are 10 generations from Adam to the flood of Noah. Noah lives after the flood. Adam and Eve are appointed as the royal image, that royal priesthood within the garden by the God of Israel, by Yahweh, the one true God. And then Noah, the tenth, is chosen to survive the flood. So you see some striking similarities here. And I, I'm going to say this right now before we get, you know, a little bit more into this. This does not mean that, because you, you'll hear this argument occasionally, and it's a really bad one. And whether, this, whether it comes from secular scholarship or um, more, you know, Christian-based scholarship, scholars will agree that it's a bad way to argue this point. But they'll say, see, look, you know, the people in Genesis, they just, you know, they just took this Sumerian king list and then they just copied it over, you know, word for word and just inserted their own names. Nobody, nobody in the academic world thinks that. So it's a very bad argument. But anyways, we go on and on about that, but we won't. Um, you'll see a striking similarity that there's very high um, as, even more astronomically high age ranges within the Sumerian king list. You know, you've got 67,200, so a little bit more than 930, but um, you'll, you'll see the numbers are higher. And um, th there's been discussion around 
you know, is there correlation essentially between the ages from the Sumerian king list and the biblical list? Before I get into that, though, I do want to point out um, something that's, you know, another similarity to this. You'll see this, this guy right here again. I'm not going to try and pronounce these names. By the way, if you have this list memorized for the Sumerian king list after this, Jeremy has an Amazon gift card for you, so see him. He'll, uh, he, can, he can quiz you. But um, this is the seventh person in the Sumerian king list line. And it contrasts with Enoch, who's the seventh person in the Genesis 5. Now, this character right here had a unique relationship with the gods of his time, according to this story. And Enoch, um, it was said, Enoch had a unique relationship with Yahweh. It said he walked with God. And so there's similarity there, and it goes more in depth than that. But what's very interesting is that this, this king right here on this list was actually, again, he's seventh in line. And it ended up that his, the city that was associated with him, it's their, the main deity that they worshiped there was the sun. So it was a city of sun, of sun worship, essentially. And some people have drawn the fact that Enoch might actually be a play. The 365 years that Enoch lived before he was taken up, again, Enoch walked with God, he did not see death, is actually a play against this king right here and the sun deity, basically because we have one solar year would be 365 days. So again, it's just, it's an option on the table. I'm not here to say it's right or wrong, but people have drawn correlation to, you know, more polemic here going on. So that the, the statement would be that 365 wouldn't be the literal amount of years that he lived. Rather, it's a play and an understanding on, you know, he's being contrasted with someone whose, um, who's, you know, main city was ba had sun god worship as their, as their main form of worship. So interesting there as well. Um, and then this is, this is something just kind of going on with the high numbers thing from the Sumerian king list. People have long recognized that they use a base 60 system. So we use a base 10, kind of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. In the ancient world, they used a base 60 system. So every single one of these ages in some way, shape, or form is, um, is kind of within that 60. It goes back. You can do all kinds of mathematical formulas based on the number 60 or 60 times 60. And then this focus on the number 60 represents a common ancient Near Eastern uh, convention rather than biological reality for the Sumerian king list. And the intention is to idealize kingship by expressing the duration of each reign in terms of multiples of the fundamental number. So 60 being the fundamental number, they're just kind of saying, hey, our, our kings are correlated with this fundamental number. And then in the, gene, in the Genesis genealogy, um, there's a play on this number 60 system. Obviously, the, the ages aren't as high, but it uses multiples of 60 or even 60 itself. And there's a really good article that, that I read by, I can't remember the guy's name. It was something Bailey. But he kind of did all the mathematical formulas in there. And basically, when it comes down to both of these lists, is there's an understanding that there's some kind of ancient mathematical play going on here as well. And like Jeremy said, there's nobody from that time period living around to be like, hey, here's the answer to the code. It's like the Da Vinci code. Like, you just can't crack it. You know what I mean? Like, we don't, we don't know it yet. We don't have enough information. But it's, it's fun to kind of dive down the rabbit hole on this. But here's an interesting correlation right here, because we'll talk about the flood here momentarily. But the volume of Noah's Ark is 450,000 cubic units, which can be expressed in this long equation based back to, guess what, the number 60. And so there might be a play actually on that as well. And then this is something that's related because you get, you know, you get um, Abraham, you get Joseph, um, you know, people that were in Egypt, you get Joshua as well, and then also Sarah, Abraham's wife. The ideal age, and this is more just to show you how numbers can, are thought to be um, or discussion around like number play within the Bible, but the ideal age among the Egyptians varied between 110 or 120 based on various Egyptian sources. When you look at the people who, were, who had some time in Egypt, you see that Moses lived to be 120, Joshua lived to be 110, Joseph lived to be 110, and then Sarah is kind of the oddball out in a good way. She lived to be 127, but the thought behind that is that she lives the perfect age of 120, or that ideal age of 120, and then she gets a bonus seven being a number of completeness. So Sarah gets a bonus, whereas Moses, Joshua, and Joseph did not. So way to go, Sarah. But it's just kind of you know, up for discussion as well. And that's just to show you how, how kind of number play, again, Jeremy talked about the number 40, but how there can be, how there's thought behind various number play throughout the Bible. And I'm not going to read this, this whole um, spiel right here, but essentially what it's saying is there's a scholar by the name of Dave 
Fots, I believe is how his name is pronounced, but he did a dissertation, and I think he's a, conf- he's a believer as well. Um, I think he is, but he did his entire dissertation for his PhD on high numbers in the Bible, and he, bas- he goes on to say this, and his work was, I heard it in relation to kind of the conquest and the exodus about, you know, high numbers in military, that kind of thing, but he said this, the large numbers are often simply figures of speech employed to magnify King Yahweh, King David, or others in a theologically based historiographical narrative. And so high numbers, this kind of summarizes this, this quote up here, high numbers in the Bible are actually a form and a way of telling real historical information. They just might not be using numbers the way that we do today. You know, where it might be the number 40 represents that completeness. It might be the number seven represents, again, a complete cycle, or, you know, we, we go down the rabbit hole with all, with all the examples throughout the Bible. But it's just a way, again, not saying it's right or wrong one way or the other, but it's a way to think when we come to, you know, high numbers, maybe within that Genesis chapter 5, maybe it's a way to think about it. Maybe it's a way to, to just approach the conversation, because one point of discussion that people have brought up in relation to Genesis chapter 5 is this, when God promises Abraham and Sarah that they're going to have a child, um, Genesis 17, 17 says this, then Abraham fell on his face and laughed, and he said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And when you look at the age range on that Genesis chapter 5 list, the, the, rate, the ages range from 65 to 500, and the average age is 156 when the father had a child. So in other words, the average age where a child was born to someone from that Genesis 5 genealogy is 156. So it, and people have asked the question of, well, if the average age there was 156 and someone even had a child when they were 500, then why would it be a big deal right here for Abraham and Sarah to bear, you know, to have a child when he's, nine, or he's 100 and she's 90? And there's various thoughts around that, but it's just something to, you know, kind of bring to mind that, you know, there might be something else going on besides, you know, literal interpretation of, of the ages. Uh, but again, it's, it's just this is all up for discussion, and these are the, you know, I'm just trying to show the discussion, I should say, around, you know, kind of these high numbers, because I think, at least for me, Genesis 5 used to be one of those chapters where, hey, read this really quick, or just skip over it, because it's really, you know, the ages are really high, I don't quite understand it, so I'm just going to pretend that I read it and move on to something cool, like, you know, the Nephilim in chapter 6, or something like that, but um, speaking of chapter 6, we'll actually get there next, but I'll show you kind of how the we talked about how the list in chapter 5 ends with Noah. And so again, Noah is 500 years old, and that's when he fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so what you'll see is something interesting. So chapter 5, that's how chapter 5 ends. And then verse 9 of chapter 6 picks up and says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And then he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it's like, okay, why did you just repeat what you told me literally eight verses ago? or nine verses ago. Well, there's this, there's this lovely um, eight-verse passage in here, I should say, about this is the sons of God seeing beautiful you know, women on earth, taking them, having offspring with them. This is where you get the giants, the Nephilim, um, that story. And then this is where God sees the wickedness of man, um, or the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and where God declares, I will blot out man, and meaning, you know, man and animal, and he goes on to say man and animals and creeping things and uh, birds of the heaven. So God's basically going to wipe everything out because of the wickedness of man. And then I, d- I do want to point out right here, when we talk about the sons of God, we're not, we're not going down the sons of God spiel tonight. We've done that in the divine council course. This is more focused on the flood tonight, but the sons of God see beautiful women um, and then they take them. So they see something that's appealing, and then they take. That's directed back towards the garden where the woman sees something that looks good, the fruit of the tree, and she takes it for herself. Cain does the exact same thing where he sees and he takes. He fails the test at the tree. And so, again, people being that you know image of a tree. So the sons of God, now there's a divine failure. At first, it was a human failure. Now it's turned into a divine failure, and the consequence for this is God's like, I'm, I'm, just, I'm blotting them out. I am blotting them out. However, verse 8 says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. And, what, and, and the reason I have Noah and favor highlighted is because they're a word play on each other. So Noah is one of those fun words in Hebrew where you get to make kind of a hacking sound, but the word Noah is Noah, and the word for favor is chen. And if you look at it, Noah 
is chin spelled backwards. Like they're, they're literally just, you flip the letters around. And so there's this wordplay of, of Noah finding favor in the eyes of the Lord. And then Noah obviously means rest, which we'll get into. And so, the, and just that these eight chapters, or these not chapters, these eight verses right here have sent, have sent many people down wild rabbit chases um, of who are the Nephilim, you know, kind of the Indiana Jones here, let's go digging for skull, you know, giant skeletons across the globe. And we're not getting into that tonight, tonight again. This, this really, I heard this from, I can't remember who I heard it from originally, but the scholar I heard this from was basically that those eight verses right there are a time stamp. They're a time stamp in the story, very similar to how if you and I were just to talk, make, you know, be in casual conversation and make a two-sentence reference to the Redcoats, we would know that we're talking about the Revolutionary War. It's something commonly known in our time period, and the same thing is going on right there. And basically what it boils down to is that what the, what the Bible is getting at is that Babylon's boasting is actually the spread of corruption throughout humankind. So where Babylon thought that, you know, kind of these giants and people were basically good people, they're like, hey, we're descendants of them, they're great. The, you know, the Bible's just like, actually, no, it's not. It's like a rebellion against the one true God. And so just have that in there to show you that this is really more of a time stamp of kind of, hey, we're letting you know what, what part of the story we're talking about right here. But it would have been common knowledge back in that day. So on to Genesis, um, on to the flood account, really, Genesis 6 through 8, here's the grand summary, and we looked at this a little bit when we were talking about garden imagery, um, I believe in week two, but here's the, here's the summary of it. God chose a royal priest, again, that's Noah, whose name is Rest, to build an ark and rescue all the animals he created in them. The ark becomes this floating garden of Eden because of what he takes on the ark with him. He takes livestock, he takes animals, you know, everything that you would have found in the garden of Eden. And again, Noah's name meaning rest, he's placed in charge of this floating garden that floats upon the, wa the chaotic waters of the deep that burst forth to create, or that God brings forth for this flood. And then the ark comes to rest on a mountain, um, and then God restores the Edenic covenant. And so, you know, we talked about, you know, the mountain Eden is described actually as a mountain in, in the or in the book of Ezekiel. So you got this garden comes to you know this garden comes to rest on a mountain, correlating to the garden and the mountain of God. And so and then again, God restores the Edenic covenant, very much what He did with Adam and Eve. He didn't restore it; He started it with them. You know, kind of start over and with the royal priesthood. So that's the summary of it. Um, now, where a lot of discussion with flood has, has gone recently, I would say in recent times, I guess. Now, I'm not saying these things are necessarily bad. I'm just trying to get maybe um, more so like what, what story is trying to be is, are the, is would the original audience have been thinking about. We, we talk a lot, and you may have seen in the news like, hey, did we actually find the ark or the remains of the ark? This is a picture from where some believe they found remnant of the ark in Turkey, I believe. But we're tending to, we're trying to go, you know, it's kind of like, hey, where is it? Where is it? And then also, you know, what, anim what all animals were on the ark? You know, were there dinosaurs on the ark? Were there penguins on the ark? You know, any kind of variation of animals that you have. And so that's where the discussion, at least that I've seen, has, has tended to revolve around. But again, going back to this point of, of the organization of the narrative rather than, and the story, rather than just simply putting, you know, modern questions that, you know, I have into the text. Kind of talked about that a little bit last week with that 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all scriptures God breathed um, for equipping us to walk godly lives, not necessarily to answer every question. But just something to keep in mind as we're going forward, because what we're going to do is look at the liter literary style of the flood. And it's, it's truly remarkable. This, this onion in and of itself goes so, so deep. We're just going to barely scratch the surface of it tonight. But Genesis 6 through 8 is written in chiastic structure. Again, that's this narrative where you have you know, this A, B, C, D, D would be the hinge point here, and then it reverses back on itself, and you know, C, B, A order. And so you basically have this buildup hinge point, which is the central theme of the story, and then it falls back on itself. And that's so that you know where the hinge point of the story is. That's designed to be, you know, it's a literary style designed to show you the important part of the story. Um, and then, my word, there it is. The, what we'll see is that the flood story, it actually harkens back to Genesis 1, and it's an invitation to follow a single family. Again, that line, that righteous line from Adam to Noah. So again, have this up here just to show that, again, Noah being righteous, because Noah, just like Enoch that we looked at with in that Genesis 5, this is where they're correlated, Enoch walked with God, Noah walked with God, that same Hebrew word 
is used for both of those instances. So let's get into the chiasm, because I love it. All right, so the chiasm of the flood, there are 14 separate scenes, and it's actually two combined macro chiasms. So you got chiasm one, chiasm two, that actually make up this one giant macro structure. The whole story becomes essentially, because of the double chiasm, becomes a two by two which is very likely intentional given the two by two, you know, you just take the animals two by two on the ark. So there's so much play in this. I, I love it. But the scenes, they're marked out by, by really not, not exclusively, but these are kind of the big markers to how the scenes are divided out in the chiasm. It will be a reference to Noah and his sons, or there will be some type of statement of time. We will see the number 40. So glad you mentioned that earlier. Um, this is, we're not going through all this. This is just to show you kind of what the macro structure of it would look like. There's genealogies, again, from chapter 5 that go into actually chapter 10 that surround this giant chiasm that ultimately meet in the middle. And the middle point is, is absolutely fascinating that we'll get to. Um, this, again, is just... I zoomed it in, I just took the genealogies out, but this, this you can actually see kind of the build up here, one through, you know, one to seven, and then seven back down through. And so I'll go over a couple of these. I'm not going to go through the, the exhaustive list, but I'm just, there's chiasms within the chiasms. Like, it is truly remarkable. You'll have, um, you'll have some verses that have chiasms within, like, kind of a two or three verse cycle, and then interwoven with that, is another chiasm that involves two more. It, it just, it goes so deep. It goes so deep. But here's, here's a good starting point in terms of recognizing chiastic structure within the Bible and also specifically here the flood narrative. This is where 40 comes in. You get this period of, there's two days of seven, uh, seven days of waiting. Um, and then that is followed by 40 days of the flood. There's that 40 number. Then, the, then for 150 days, the waters prevail. And here's the central hinge point in the middle. God remembers Noah. He remembered Noah and the promise that he, get, that he made with him. Once Noah is remembered, you get 150 days where water, instead of prevailing, now the waters are going down. And then you have another 40-day cycle where it's the end of the flood, and then that's followed by two days of waiting for the, for the waters to fully subside. And so you can see this 7-7 seven, seven on both ends, the 40s and then the 150s, and then it, the, that central hinge point. Again, this is designed to tell you that, hey, the important part of this story is that God remembers Noah. Here's one other one. And this is just, um, this is a little bit smaller, but again, Noah is the central, God remembering Noah is the central point of this. It's where the waters increase, um, you know, in, con in contrast with the waters going down, the mountains are covered, then the mountaintops become visible, and then God remembers Noah again. So these are just, you know, again, there's many more chiasms in there than this, but this I hope this is helpful, and you know, if you go back and you read the story, you're reading somewhere in the Bible, and you start seeing patterns of days or numbers or even words pop up, that there's likely a, some type of, either some type of chiastic structure or linear, or linear sequence going on to try and point you to the main theme of the passage that you're reading. So I, th I think it's fascinating that it's written this way. It, and this is where my opinion comes in real quick, but it, it shows me that yes, this text truly is inspired. It's one of the things that gives confirmation to me about the text being the inspired word of God. Like only he's gonna organize it and you know, or inspire that organization in the way that it was written. So I think it's um, very, very special. But this is where the disclaimer comes in from Jeremy right here. We're going to loop back in to God favor Noah in a minute, but I did just want to cover this because it, it has been somewhat of a, of a hot topic, I think, in the past. But just this is, here's the disclaimer again. That we're going to talk about the global. Was the flood global? Was it regional? Again, I'm not here to say it's one or the other. I'm here to offer both viewpoints. Again, the viewpoint, as Jeremy said earlier, First Christian stands that it's a global flood. So, um, yeah, so, but I'm just, again, I'm offering both views. I'm not saying one is correct or one is not. So just here are both views. Um, you have, you have the view, we'll kind of start out with the global flood. This is really where it comes from. I mean, it comes from several places within, but you get, this is chapter seven. I don't have that in here, but verses 19 through 22, you'll see phrases like the earth, um, on, uh, and the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered and that all flesh died on the earth. And then you get two more instances of, you know, all swarming creatures and all humankind. Um, and then we talked about the word, we talked about the word, this is where the discussion starts right here, global, regional, again, this is just me sharing information, but that word earth is the same Hebrew word that we looked at in the Genesis 1 part that means land. The word eretz means land, that word translated all, all in whole right here are actually the same word in Hebrew, so 
Don't you wish they would translate it the same um, sometimes? But yeah, it's the same word. It's the Hebrew word kol, which just means all or every, or in this case, whole. And then, um, yeah, so where this, where this comes into play is, again, how, and where the discussion starts is how do we think of the earth? What did they mean by the word Eretz? Did they mean globe? Did they mean land? What do they mean by all, kind of all of what? Is it, is it, is it exhaustive totality? Is it not? And where some people have pointed, again, this kind of sharing, like the points that would, that would seem, um, th this is points for the regional right here, where people have drawn in like, hey, it, it can't mean exhaustive totality all the time. This is where Abram and Lot are speaking together. And um, they eventually say, Abram says, is not the whole land before you. When he's talking like, hey, Lot, we're looking out at this land, like to the left and to the right. And it's, those, it's that same pairing of words, is not the coal Eretz before you. And so he, he wouldn't be talking about the whole earth in this instance. You can't see the whole earth from any mountain that you stand on, but it's just a selection more so of land. There's also 2 Samuel that says, the battle spread over the face of all the country and the forest and devoured more people that day than the sword. So country in this instance is the same word Eretz as land. I'm not sure why it's translated country in the ESV, but it is. But it's the same Hebrew word, and then you get that all is the word kol right there. So this, this wouldn't be insinuating that... Or, um, yeah, this would not be speaking that the battle spread over the entire globe, if you will. And so this is just things that people are pointing out that the word all and the word land doesn't mean exhaustive totality or the entire, entire earth at one time. And then here's kind of the big one that people will point to. This is, this is from Genesis 9, chapter 19, or Genesis chapter 9, verse 19. It says, these three sons of Noah, these, these three were the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And from these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Again, there's that pattern of coal erets were dispersed. And so you get that, and I've used this before in presentations too, but this is the, land, this is the representation of Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their descendants. This is the 70 nations, which, again, has, has been talked about here um, previously. We'll also cover it because we, we come to it in Genesis chapter, <laughs> chapter 10 and chapter 11. But this right here would be all 70 nations right here represented. And what's, what's said about this is more so that, hey, this is not the entire earth, this is the entire known world at the time of the biblical authors when this story was written. And so that's the discussion around was it local, was it global, kind of in a nutshell, where you get people from both sides saying like, yeah, like, you know, it's global because of some modern current things that we know and understand or that we need to explain, or it's regional because you can't have exhaustive totality, and the discussion will go on and on and on and on until Jesus comes back, and then he'll settle it. Actually, he probably won't because nobody will care at that point. We'll just be glad to see him. So <laughs> if we're still caring about that when he comes back, maybe, um, yeah, we, let's not go down that route, but hopefully we won't care about it. But what I want to look at now is, is harken back. Um, is what is the point of the flood story? So a little bit of a rabbit trail on the global and regional, but again, want to just, in case you hear it, you know, being prepared to give a defense for the hope that is within us. If we hear these things, I think it's valuable that we hear kind of every side um, to an argument, whether we agree or disagree. But that being said, I'm going to ask the question, what is the point of the flood story? And um, people have argued just based on the, sh on the style that it's written in, again, God remembering Noah at that kind of central hinge point of it, the flood account is actually a decreation story. And again, there's my favorite word on line two that I'm not going to say for the third time. But it's a decreation story. And this really, chapter six of Genesis is where you start getting words and terminology from the first five chapters that start getting repeated. And so those themes that you're being taught in the first five chapters end up playing back here. So um, and the flood is also, it's a story written to set the record straight about, again, there was a known flood account throughout kind of the whole ancient Near East at that time. Every culture essentially had a flood account. And so this is, you know, it's a way of describing, hey, we get that you think so-and-so caused it, so-and-so caused it, but it's actually Yahweh that caused it for specific reasons. So I want to go back to that central hinge point of Noah, of remembering Noah. We covered this in week two. When we, were in, when we covered the first three verses of Genesis 1, which ironically, we covered three verses in the first week, and tonight we're covering four and a half chapters. So, um, you know, hey, the Lord works, the Lord works. But um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the, kind of the third part of that is, well, here's the whole verse. It says, now the earth, same word, air, it's right there. Now the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we looked again, that Spirit being the word Hebrew word ruach, which can mean breath, wind, or spirit. And the waters are the waters of the deep. Right there, that's why they're, they're both in blue. 
and that God is in control. He's hovering over right here. He's hovering over these chaotic waters um, in the creation narrative of Genesis 1. And then when we look at um, Genesis chapter 8, verse 1, this is what we get. And God remembered Noah. Again, there's that central theme. God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a ruach. God made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsided. So here you see the spirit, the same words, ruach, you know, breath, wind, or spirit. God made a ruach blow over the earth and the water subsides. So in Genesis, you get Genesis 1, or Genesis in both instances, Genesis 1, you get God's spirit hovering over the waters. Here again, there's that ruach hovering or coming over the waters. And then the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were closed because of this. So where the deep, you know, where God in Genesis 1 created in the midst of that deep and chaotic waters, you know, just because he was in full control, here the fountains of the deep um, and the windows of heaven were closed, and the rain from the heavens was restrained. And so this word deep, again, right here, it's the same Hebrew word from Genesis 1, the word to home, which is that dark, chaotic ocean. So you can really see this picture here of this little Eden boat floating, floating on the midst of the chaotic sea, and then God's Spirit coming over the waters, and then the deep waters, the chaotic waters residing when, when the Spirit does that. And then we covered this just, again, this was kind of the, one of the pictures and one of the interpretations that we looked at, kind of that expanse. Um, what is the expanse? You know, what is being described here? Is it modern cosmology? Is it ancient cosmology? But this is where I'm just having this up here because I don't know if you can see these little slashes kind of through this right here. Those, there's, there's reference throughout the scriptures as well, but the, kind of the windows of heaven language would kind of be, you know, the waters that were above and then the waters from the deep below. The windows of heaven were closed so that the waters above you know, could not come through anymore, and the waters of the deep subsided. So you kind of have this like, hey, I'm going to turn the faucet off up here, if you will, for an analogy, and then I'm going to, you know, the drain down here, and so you're not getting water from anywhere up there. And uh, so going on, just kind of in this from, you know, Genesis, you know, the next two verses um, in chapter 8, you have, and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. Now, there's that 150 again that you kind of see play in that theme. Again, 150 and 150 are kind of are the, are the last two chiasms before you get to that central hinge point, or the last two chiastic uh, narratives before you get there. This is really cool. This is actually, I think, my favorite correlation that I learned. But it says in verse 4 that, and in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And so... Why the seventh month and why the seventeenth day? Again, is is it literal? Yeah, sure, it could be literal. But is there something more going on at play here, or, or are they interwoven together? So, um, you know, you can make the decision there for how how you want to interpret. Obviously, but I think there's something to the seventh month and the seventeenth day that people have pointed out. So, we'll talk about the seventh month first. So. Again, this being a correlation to Genesis chapter 1 and that creation narrative, we looked at kind of day 2 gets repeated and day 3 gets repeated, you know, in that sense of the waters and the deep, that, um, which we'll get into a little bit more here in a minute. But the seventh month, 17th day, day 7 of the creation narrative of Genesis 1 is when God rests from all that he had done. So the ark actually comes to rest in the seventh month. So you get this correlation between the resting on the seventh, so the month and the day, you know, day from from Genesis 1 and then month from Genesis 8. Um, again, because God rested from all he had done. And then the occurrence of 7 that we looked at from Genesis chapter 1, God speaks 10 times in Genesis um, chapter 1 in that creation narrative. So 7 are divine commands and 3 are divine initiatives, but he speaks a total of 10 times. And so seven, you know, 7 plus 3 is 10, but then you get kind of that theme play on 7 too. So there's this idea that hey, 10 plus 7 is 17, so the 17th day is looping you back into these divine commands plus a cycle of completeness on the number 7. So it's just, it's another one of these, of these numerical kind of patterns that might be at play here that, you know, it, you know, we in our modern mind, I'm speaking for myself here, like I don't think anything. When I think the seventh month of the 17th day, I'm like, okay, cool, thanks, thanks for letting me know the day he got there. But there might be something more going on. Like it might be that, yes, but there might be another, another layer to that onion as well. Um, and then the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Again, um, the ark rests. So this Eden, this floating Eden rests on the mountains. 
This is Ezekiel 28, verse 13. It says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. And then later in verse 18, it says, I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. So Eden is a, it's a garden, but it's also a holy mountain, kind of this garden, holy mountain. And so you have, you know, you have this floating garden resting on the mountain. So I think it's just, you know, to me, it blows my mind. I'm like, okay, someone's behind this and they're not human. But <laughs> that, that, you know, that's, um, that's just my take on it. But um, we'll also talk about the length of the flood. So length of the flood, the flood starts in the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month on the 17th day. And there's that 17th again. And then the flood ends on the 600, in the 601st year in the second month again on the 27th day. I know, Jeremy, you had, I meant to ask you, but you had a book that talked about the, se- the second month um, that you shared when we were actually here for the new moon celebration in the, in the second month. But there was something I meant to ask you on that, maybe share afterwards just kind of what that, because um, I think there's some correlation there as well, thinking about this. But I always, it, it made me scratch my head when I was reading this. Like the 27th day, like why can't it just be the 17th? Why can't we do like one full? Like what's going on here? Why is there a separation of 10? I ended up talking to Alan about this because Al, Alan, you actually approached me about it. And Alan made a fantastic point that when we look at, we've, we've talked about, the fall feast days in here before about how day of trumpets was um, thought to be correlating back to the original day of creation and tradition like it's that day of creation 10 days later you have the day of atonement and so there's this link between you know a full year plus 10 days you have would have creation to creation plus 10 days being the day of atonement and then that linking into you talk about in the the new testament where it talks about how the days of noah it, it will be like the days of Noah coming back. So really interesting correlation. Thank you for sharing that, by the way, Alan. D- want to give you the shout out there. But um, so yeah, so um, my moment of head scratch, like why can't it just be even? Turns into be, hey, this is likely a play on God's appointed times, which would again go back to Genesis 1 where he places the stars in the sky for that purpose. So um, again, so one, <laughs> a couple more correlations here um, for when they actually get off the ark. Remember, God restores the Edenic covenant with, um, with Noah and his family, and he tells them to be fruitful and multiply. And this is, um, this is when God actually says, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, all the animals. That's why I have the lemur here with that, you know, scared looking face there. But so there's this divine command again, there's this Edenic covenant being restored to be fruitful and multiply. And when we look at this, we go back to Genesis 1, be fruitful and multiply. God tells the fish and the birds. So you know, when the waters were separated, waters above, waters below, the fish that live in the waters above, and then the birds that are up in the air um, above, that um, they are the ones that are told to be fruitful and multiply in Genesis 1, and the humans are told to do so also. We get to Genesis 6, um, really, I guess Genesis 8, because that's when the, that, or Genesis 8, 9, because that's when the flood has gone down. When they get off the ark, the same command of be, of be fruitful and multiply is given, again, to Noah and his family, so to the humans, but instead of the fish and the birds this time, it's given to the animals from the ark. And I think, you know, not I think, but, you know, just going back into, you know, the correlation between this, the, you know, the fish and the birds, you know, the birds, they can fly. They can still fly. They're not, you know, you know when the flood comes, like, or they can be on the ark, you know, they can be resting on it there. Um, and then the fish, obviously, if there's a bunch of water, they can be swimming around. Like, you know, I don't, I don't think the Bible says anything about Noah bringing a giant aquarium on the, on the ark with him because, the, the, you know, the fish are swimming down there below. But you have this instance where the animals now need to get off and be fruitful and multiply. It's the whole point of two by two. And so where you have the fish and the birds from Genesis chapter one being told to be fruitful and multiply, now you have the animals. So all of creation has essentially been told to be fruitful and multiply at various points within this story. And then most importantly, humans in both, in both instances. And I... Um, I, I would dare to say that, that it's kind of that double meaning. Again, the humans, yes, you know, earth, you know, you need to procreate for the population of the earth, but also in terms of, you know, more so the royal priesthood, like bring people into the kingdom, much like the great commission calling in our lives is really, um, again, this is my personal belief that the, the great commission is linked very much to that identic covenant, be fruitful and multiply. Um, and so again, this is just kind of, to kind of recap where we've been, but the flood account um, being terms like in its literary style that it's written in, it's, it's told as a decreation story, as a decreation narrative. So God created in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and then because of the wickedness, both divine and humanity, he decreates and tries to start over with, with quote unquote, a new Adam who will ultimately fail. Again, the, you know, the, one, the one new Adam that came and you know, passed the test was Jesus. 
But again, it goes back, you start seeing all this, all this terminology that's been used in the previous five chapters, and it's written to explain the known flood account and to give credit to the one true God for what had happened. And it's also the story of God's judgment on the wicked world. Again, I've just kind of talked about that, but re reinstating that royal priesthood. And again, we looked at genealogies being important, you know, kind of Adam to Noah through Seth, that being a righteous line down there. And then ultimately, this really ties into the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent that ultimately plays all the way out. And we see, obviously, come to fruition, you know, in, in fullness, I would say, to Jesus or, or with Jesus and what he did on the cross. But just, and this is the final slide of the night, but just to, to come and, and speak to this one more time, that again, when we combine these two views, kind of the modern view and the ancient view, we can make a pretty picture, we can make a pretty theology, but I think really what we're trying to do in these, you know, within these six weeks, and again, I'm on the journey with, is to remove as much of this as possible from this so that I can see the original patterns, the original design, ultimately the original message that God was trying to convey when he, when he inspired people that were living thousands of years ago to pass on this text that we call the Bible that we now read today as an inspired text for how to go about and to live a godly lifestyle. So that's my prayer that we'll continue to do that and wanted to show, again, maybe a different account on the flood narrative and also the genealogies, why genealogies are important. And uh, spoiler alert, there's an entire genealogy next week too in chapter 10. So, um, but Jeremy, if you want to come back up here, say a couple words, you don't have to, no pressure, but if you want to, um, appreciate all of you coming tonight and everybody who watched on live stream. So thanks so much. No, thank you, Brad. That was good, wasn't it? So I, just, I need to just read one thing. I know that if you're like my mind, it's probably packed right now. First, I got to tell you something funny, just the way that Brad thinks. And I love that he breaks it down the way he did. I look up two months ago, he sent me some email with like, I forget how many pages. It was this huge like document of some scholar with vocabulary that I don't use at all. And he's like, hey, you should really read this. So I open it up and I get like five lines in. I got like, I'm seeing like the words don't make sense. There's blurs. I'm like, and I said to myself, I was like, there's no way I'm reading this. And then as soon as I said that, Brad texts me. He's like, don't worry, I'll read it and give you the bullet points. And I was like, Yes, but I just got to, I have to read you this because it's cool. That 40 that I talked about, so I need to read. So this is a Hebrew Greek keyword study Bible, NASB, introductions, footnotes, cross references, concordance, Strong's dictionaries with some other stuff, word studies, right? Brad's not reading this. Brad decides to talk about numbers tonight, right? How often do you hear sermons about numbers that play a part? He, I have no idea he's going about this, and I literally read this before, as right near the, the, the time of the conversation. So just to go back to that 40, so like, I really think the Lord is on to something. So you just need to hear the, the confirmation, which is so cool. The number 40 is not merely an arbitrary period or a round number. It was chosen to convey a sense of fullness. Some of its, some of its prominent scripture uses are Noah, open the window of the ark, after another 40 days, 40 days was the period of embalming Joseph. Moses was uh, 40 days on the mountain. Israel uh, sent spies in to Canaan for 40 days. The Israelites wandered for 40 years. Moses fasted twice for 40 days. Jews were forbidden to inflict more than 40 stripes. Goliath defied Saul's army for 40 days. And it keeps on go, go, going to eventually ends off with Jesus in the desert for 40 days. And then also uh, the last one is Jesus talking to his disciples for 40 days before he gets rounded up. So you have two options there. You can be like, is this really 40 or are these numbers literal? literal, Or could they be a sense of meaning that we just don't understand, like you talked about the Da Vinci Code, but because we don't have that mindset, we have no idea. I believe that Jesus, strictly because we know numbers from his resurrection to, to Pentecost, it was 50 days, and we know that there was a 10-day period. So yeah, he probably talked to them for 40 days, literal. But does that mean that every other 40 in the Bible has to be literal? I don't know. But it doesn't threaten me to be like, hey, it might not or it might. But in that time period, when they saw 40, they saw a, a sense of fullness. As where we go immediately to the number first, they went to the meaning of what that number went to, right? And that could have been happening with a lot of the genealogies here. We're reading just numbers. We're like, ah, pass. Meanwhile, people back then are like, oh, hey, I don't know what they would say because I'm not there, but they'd say stuff according to the numbers, right? So 
It's just really interesting. So, Brad, thank you. Thank you for sharing that tonight. This was excellent, excellent, excellent. So we are four, week four in, literally week four in, and uh, two weeks left. Next week, we'll go through actually chapter 11, actually technically a couple verses into chapter 12, um, but we'll, we'll wrap up all of Genesis 1 through 11, and then week 6 is really going to be a recap, kind of trying to piece together all these little microstructures that we've looked at to kind of paint the picture of what of the narrative of these first 11 chapters, because ultimately they're part 1 of Genesis. Genesis is 50 chapters. We have 1 through 11 as part 1, and then 12 through 50 is part 2. And that one little hinge point between the two is actually chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. So we'll look at those two. So just fascinating, right? Even that Sumerian king list, too, tonight. One of the things I was thinking about, it's just like the devil to try and take truth and pervert it, right? And then you have the, then you have the Bible like, nope, I'm going to smash that, smash that, smash that. I just, you know, the devil tells a little, tries to put some truth in there and twist it. And uh, always a counterfeit. There's always a counterfeit. Spiritual warfare, right? So, 